Welcome to the first seminar for 2020, the ACOM seminar series, and our first speaker is Camille. Um, so Camille got his PhD in 2013 at the University of Paris with Bernard Amont, and did his first postdoc with Laurent de Guillaume at the University of Clermont-Ferrand in France. Um, during that time, he worked on some mechanisms for gecko A for cloud chemistry. Um, and then he moved to the University of York with Andrew Rickard in 2015, again working on uh, gecko A and MCM, focusing on building a new method to predict Kriegi intermediates, which I looked up and apparently are important for aerosols and the hydroxyl radical. Um, so the last few years, he's been working with Sasha, applying gecko A to study uh, real case studies and um, focusing on the interaction of biogenic and anthropogenic chemistry. Um, and in a few weeks, he's going to move to the University of Toulouse to start a new position with Alma, working on um, urban pollution chemistry with Gecko A. Um, so, Camille, take it away. OK. Uh, can you hear me? Is it working? OK. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Thank you for uh, having me for this seminar. So I'm going to talk about uh, one of the things I've done when, while I was here for three years uh, in ACOM. And uh, it's uh, about um, the, the Manaus urban plume and its interaction with the biogenic air masses. And uh, I, I studied that with an explicit organic chemistry, uh, chemistry mechanism. So uh, everything I'm going to talk about, well, most of the things I'm going to talk about are currently in this uh, submitted paper in ACP, and I should be receiving the review soon. So I would like to thank all my co-authors for that. Uh, some of them are here and work at NCAR. <coughs> and it was a collaboration with uh, people from, uh, from NCAR and Brazil and uh, other places, and CU2 and places like that. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, for this study, we, we, we looked at a field campaign that happened in the, the Amazonian rainforest in 2014 and 2015. So <clears throat> the, the place we're looking at is the city of Manaus, which is situated like in the middle of the Amazonian rainforest. So the urbanized area is the pink dot that you can see here, and the rest around it is uh, just a tropical rainforest. So it's like 2 million inhabitants right in here. And then it's thousands of kilometers of just trees and rivers. Uh, Manaus is situated at the, where the Black River and Solimoes River join to make the Amazon River. Um, so this um, point source of anthropogenic pollution, is, uh, Manaus is a point source of anthropogenic pollution in a clean background. So that was the ideal place to study interactions between biogenic and anthropogenic air masses. So during that field campaign, they had several sites, some in very clean background, some in Manaus. And the main instrumented site was uh, the site called T3, which was 70, 70 kilometers downwind, downwind of Manaus. Uh, and they also had uh, airborne, me airborne measurements sampling the urban plume. So um, these airborne measurements, for instance, look like that where you have the, the trace of the airplane trajectory over time. And the, the height of the trace is the, the particle number concentration measured by the airplane. And you can see here this uh, increase in number of particles uh, in this trace, which shows us where the Manaus plume is. And if you look at where is the T3 site for that particular day, the T3 site was not exposed to the Manaus plume. It was in a clean background conditions. Uh, in another case, for, example, for instance here, you still have the same peaks of particle numbers when the airplane is in the plume. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in that particular case, the T3 site was exactly in line with Manaus in the plume, so they were sampling polluted air in that case. And for other kind of measurement shows, uh, so they're able to, uh, at the T3 site, these are measurements at the T3 site, we're able then to differentiate between background and polluted conditions. And we can look, for instance, so the particle, particle number concentration, that is what is plotted here, basically, is the, the 
dark red line do you see here? So you see it goes from a few, less than a, a hundred uh, particles per cubic centimeters to uh, almost a thousand particles per cubic centimeter in the polluted plume. Uh, <clears throat> and similarly, you can see an increase in ozone concentration, the yellow line you can see here. You can see increase in, a slight increase in sulfates, increase in NOx concentrations, mixing ratios, sorry. But we can look closely at the uh, organic particulate matter, the green dots that you can see here. Uh, in background condition, the, the particulate matter was between one and two micrograms per cubic meters. And in polluted condition, this uh, concentration would increase up to three micrograms per cubic meter. So this uh, plume had a, the, um, sorry, the, the anthropogenic sources have an impact on the organic mass concentration, but they also have an impact on the composition of that organic mass. So we can look at the SOA formed from isoprene chemistry that we call uh, IEPOXY. So in that case, uh, in black, it's their absolute concentration in the plume, and the pink dots are their fraction in the organic, frac in the, uh, <clears throat> in the organic matter. And you can see that this contribution decreases a lot when we are in polluted conditions. So the idea here is that the city has a significant impact on organic aerosol mass and composition. And we wanted to see if we could model this impact with a model based on the current knowledge of atmospheric organic chemistry. <clears throat> so to uh, run this model, uh, we did a simple box model setup, and you will see later why we stick with a simple box model and not a 3D model. Um, we use uh, two boxes, one for the boundary layer and one for the residual layer. The boundary layer height is varying with time. We have emissions in deposition in the, box, in the bottom box, exchange between these two layers and ex exchange between the free troposphere and the residual layer. <clears throat> and with that, we can build two sorts of scenarios. One polluted scenarios where we assume the box would travel from the rainforest, interact with Manaus emissions, and then reach the T3 site. And another case, case where the air mass doesn't interact with Manaus, is just exposed to uh, biogenic emission uh, for the whole simulation. Then we can compare the both and have an idea of what is the impact of the city on uh, organic um, aerosol. So another way to look at it is here as a function of time. The evolution of the boundary layer height is the black line. Um, we estimated this evolution with the parameterization from uh, Don Lenshaw. And I scaled that to match the few cilometer measurements that were available at T3. <coughs> and the idea is that the, the box is traveling uh, is traveling in the rainforest. So when there is a green background means that we have biogenic emissions. Sometime in the morning, these emissions are replaced by urban emissions from the city of Manaus. And then we come back to biogenic emission until we reach the T3 site, which is approximately four to six hours downwind of Manaus. And then we can compare the measurement that we've done at the T3 site during that time to see if we are good enough or not uh, with the model. <coughs> Uh, of course, uh, we need also to have some deposition velocities, and we use the traditional Vesely uh, parameterization. I won't uh, expand on that. More importantly, if we, to, we want to have a realistic scenario, we need to have some emissions. So first, we, need, we looked at biogenic emissions in, uh, <coughs> in Amazonia, in this area. And for that, we used the uh, biogenic emission from the Megan uh, model. And then I used some measurements that were done in a clean uh, background environment by uh, Colby Jardin in the Amazonian rainforest. And we obtained these profiles, uh, this uh, diurnal profile of emission. So uh, the black line is isoprene emission over time, uh, divided by 10 just to fit in the scale by a factor of 10 just to fit in the graph. Uh, the dashed line, black dashed line, is the sum of all monoterpenes emitted uh, in that scenario. And you can see already monoterpenes have not been scaled, so that means that isoprene is approximately a factor of 10 higher than monoterpenes emission. 
And the speciation of monoterpenes shows that most of the monoterpenes are uh, limonene, osimine, and alpha pinene. <coughs> so, um, also, yeah, I, I took the, the Megan emission, but I had to scale them down by a factor of five to get them to match the measured isoprene and monoterpenes at the T3 site. Um, so that's for the biogenic emission. That was not too difficult. Now we have to look at what are the organic compounds emissions in Manaus, and that's uh, a bit more complicated, especially if you want an hourly speciation of these emissions. So this is the only information we have about emissions in Manaus, which is emission factors for Manaus in 2014 for different kinds of vehicles uh, running with different kinds of fuels. So that's not enough for us because there is no hourly, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> no diurnal variation, and the VOCs are just all lumped together. We don't know what's in there. So we have to look at what is available somewhere else in Brazil. And in Brazil, there were some studies that were done in Sao Paulo, which is the largest city of Brazil, I think. Uh, in that case, uh, the good thing with this 2015 study is that we have uh, a diurnal use of different kinds of vehicles, how much they are used every day. And based on that, we can have a diurnal profile. And uh, using this other older study, study, we can get a speciation of organic compounds from C1 to C12 uh, to obtain uh, what's coming here. Yeah. So of course, we had to make the hypothesis then that the traffic in Manaus in 2014 uh, was not too different from the traffic in Sao Paulo in 2006, uh, but that's the only hypothesis we can make at the moment. So then from that, we can get hourly emissions of CO, NOx, particulate matter, SO2, and the sum of all VOCs. And we can speciate all these VOCs into uh, approximately 50 species here from C1 to C12 compounds. We don't need to look into the detail of what these species are, but the problem is that these measurements stopped at C12, but we are missing all the lower volatility compound that would be emitted by diesel car, for instance. Um, because there, there is, for instance, this study by uh, Drew Gentner that showed that intermediate volatility organic compound, which in my case, I will just be about species that have more than 12 carbon atoms. Uh, these uh, IVOCs are mainly emitted by diesel vehicle. Here you have for diesel, gasoline and all other kind of gasoline uh, emissions. The distribution of uh, emission as a function of the number of carbon atoms, and you can see that diesel vehicles mostly emit heavier compounds that uh, we didn't have in our speciation. So, <coughs> uh, in the Manaus case, approximately half of the total distance was driven by diesel vehicle. So we need to take that into account, otherwise we will miss an important fraction of the organic emissions. Uh, luckily, there was a, a study by uh, Jao et al. in 2015 and 16 that calculated that the ratio of emitted IVOCs to VOC depends on the type of fuel that was burned. And it goes from 4% for gasoline engines to 65% for diesel engines. So based on our knowledge of the VOC emission, we can extrapolate the IVOCs that were emitted with them at the same time. <clears throat> so here is what I get at the end. Uh, I will try to get you through that. So each box is uh, emissions in micrograms per square meter per, uh, yeah, in micrograms per square meter uh, as a function of the number of carbon atom for at 6 a.m., noon, and 8 p.m. The first line of graphs is the VOC's emissions I've shown you earlier, just distributed as a function of the number of carbon atoms. So this is what we are, where we are starting with. Then I have to define a speciation of the intermediate volatility organic compounds. And in that case, I follow the simple approach that was used by uh, Julia uh, for the Mex Mexico City studies in 20, 2011, where all the IVOCs are alkanes and they are distributed to match a measured uh, volatility dist distribution. But of course, 
this red part and blue part have nothing to do with, it, with each other at the moment because this was done for another case. So I need to scale this to match uh, <coughs> with the VOC emissions. So using the scaling that Zhao introduced, for instance, if we assume that all the cars in Manaus are using gasoline, then the ratio of VOC to VOC would be 4%. And this is the distribution we would get. So I don't know if you can see, but there is a very small red uh, line for the emissions, uh, IVOC emissions. Uh, oppositely, if all the cars were driving 100% with diesel fuel, the ratio would be 65% according to Zhao, and you would get that distribution. Uh, in our case, we are more close to 50% of the vehicles having uh, diesel engines, and so in that case, the ratio uh, is interpolated to approximately 30%. And this is the emissions I would be using for that study. So to summarize, this is the profile, the nature of emitted species at noon uh, as a function of the number of carbon atoms. Uh, VOC is on that side, IVOC is on that side. And the color represents the speciation of these species. So you have uh, mostly alkanes in red and uh, branched alkanes in pink. Uh, aromatics are very important too. We have a few alkenes and uh, also some oxygenated compounds. And if we compare to the distribution that was published by Gentner in 2012, which was for Los Angeles, not Manaus, uh, we still see that we have this uh, uh, peak of VOCs around seven or eight uh, uh, carbon atoms. Uh, and then we have this uh, uh, distribution of IVOCs, which in our case peaks around 13 carbon atoms, and in their case is maybe closer to 12 carbon atoms, but I think it's uh, realistic enough and uh, we have good, well, as good as we can have uh, urban emissions for Manaus. So, all these emissions, in the total we have 10 biogenic and 55 anthropogenic compounds uh, from C1 to C25. <clears throat> From that, we want to solve the chemistry of all these compounds in the boundary layer and in the residual layer. So we need to write the chemical mechanism, and that's where the, the fun is starting. So <clears throat> the problem is that I want to write a chemical me mechanism that is as detailed as possible. So that's what we call an explicit organic chemistry mechanism. What does that mean? It means that if I'm starting with, for instance, propane, I would write one reaction with OH, that would make one peroxy radical. Another reaction with OH, which would make another peroxy radical, and we make the difference between these two peroxy radicals, we don't simplify. Then each of these peroxy radicals would need to react with NO and other uh, things to make their own products. And we do that until everything is degraded to CO2 and water. Um, so for propane, I'm sure that some people here have done it by hand easily. Problem is if you have a C25, it will be more complicated to write it yourself by hand without making any mistake. So that's why we are using the generator of explicit chemistry and kinetics of organics in the atmosphere, Gecko A. <coughs> so Gecko, it's a computer program that takes a list of precursors and will produce the explicit chemical schemes uh, accompanied by some properties that we need for our box model, which would be vapor pressure or solubilities. Uh, <clears throat> so it will uh, generate all these reactions automatically, including chemical reaction and mass transfer to make organic aerosol. To write these reactions, we need to document rate constants, thermodynamical uh, properties, and things like that. So when they are available experimentally, we use the, the experimental values because there is no reason to invent anything. But if it's not available, then we use empirical relationship that we call a structure activity relationship, SAR, which is basically us telling the computer program how to guess a number when we don't know what it should be. Uh, to do all that, we need, of course, to define a protocol, which is a set of rules that tells the program how to identify oxidation pathway and how to estimate missing data. So this protocol looks a bit like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> you start with the first precursor here. And we check first for its nature. Is it a radical or a stable species? If it's a stable species, the program is checking for uh, reaction sites and writes the corresponding reactions. So for instance, if there is a double bond, the program will write the corresponding addition of OH, the reaction with ozone, and the addition of NO3. Um, <clears throat> if the species was a radical, in that case, the program will write the corresponding reaction for that radical. Uh, <clears throat> then, when you write a reaction, we check what if the new product is already known in the mechanism. If it's not known, it will be added to the stack for future treatment. Once we, are written, we have written all possible reactions for the sp first species, then uh, we can switch to the next species in the stack, and we do that until the stack is empty, which means that the, every species in the mechanism has a sink, and the explicit mechanism is complete. Okay. Uh, the thing is that for the specific case of isoprene chemistry, in Gecko, we don't have any protocol or rules concerning the formation of SOA from uh, IEPOX compounds. <coughs> so in that case, the good thing is it's already known in the literature, so we don't need to invent anything. I use uh, the isoprene chemistry from MCM. Uh, that was uh, written by the colleagues, colleagues in uh, Leeds, by Mike Jenkins mostly. And we use the parameterization from uh, Eloise Marais, which estimates the partitioning of these oxidation products into the aerosol phase as a function of uh, pH, sulfate, nitrate content, and water content. So I basically stick that handwritten mechanism to the fully explicit mechanism. And in that case, that means that we have a fully explicit mechanism for all of the species and some up-to-date chemistry for isoprene chemistry. Uh, so if I start again with my 65 organic precursors, that means that we have a tiny mechanism with approximately 60 million reactions, 4 million species. Uh, and of these 4 million species, 400,000 of them partitioned into the aerosol phase. And that's why we run that in a box model, because of course, uh, nobody wants to put that in a 3D model. I don't know why. Uh, <clears throat> so how did the model behave now? So now we start comparing to uh, experimental data. So as a function of time, I've, I have here the organic mass in microgram per cubic meter. Uh, and these are measurements at the T3 site that were classified as clean. <coughs> uh, the dot are the average value, and uh, uh, vertical spread is the, the spread of the, the measurements at the T3 site that were uh, classified as clean. So as you can see, <clears throat> the values vary between one and two microgram per cubic meter, meter. What does the model do about that? Well, the explicit model, so the blue line is the result from the explicit modeling. The explicit model is able to reasonably reproduce organic aerosol mass uh, for the Manaus situation, which we are uh, quite happy with. It's already a, a nice result. But what happens when we are uh, subjected to Manaus emissions? So the orange points are the data that was classified as polluted. And you can see that the, the, the mass increased by uh, almost a factor of two, went from uh, between one and two to two and three micrograms per cubic meter. Is the model able to reproduce this enhancement? Well, <clears throat> doesn't look as good as before now. Uh, so the orange line is what the model does when it's been subjected to Manaus emissions. And you can see the increase is only by about 20% when we were ex expecting an increase by approximately 100%. So there is a problem here. Uh, what could be that problem? Uh, the first idea is maybe we have a problem with emissions, precursors, concentrations, or oxidants levels. Uh, we can look at uh, some precursors here. Isoprene, the sum of all monoterpenes in a clean case scenario, uh, as a function of time. And you can see that the measurements and the model agree quite well, I think. And in a polluted case, uh, same thing with benzene and toluene. 
And you can see the very strong injection of anthropogenic compound when the box is over my house. And then the decay gets the, the concentration to match the measured concentration at the T3 site. <coughs> so uh, in, if we look at oxidant concentration, it's uh, not as good, but fine enough, I think. Uh, if you look at ozone mixing ratio, for instance, the model is slightly underestimating the measurements at this site and overestimating a little bit the measurement at the, uh, for the polluted case at the T3 site. <coughs> but we still see an enhancement in ozone that was observed experimentally. For NOx uh, mixing ratio, uh, same story. We are slightly un underestimating the, the mixing ratios uh, in the clean case scenario. And we are in the upper range of the measurements during the polluted case. For OH, well, it's more complicated, but you see the orange dots here. And the measurements tell us that the orange dots and the blue dots coincide uh, uh, between the clean and the polluted case in, at the T3 site. I have some uh, trouble believing that. And uh, the, the model is able to reproduce the background concentration measured experimentally at the T3 site. But the model is seeing this large peak of OH in the plume that was not seen experimentally. But in that case, I think it's, it's certainly a problem with the instrument. And uh, maybe Gecko is overestimating OH, but I don't think that nothing is happening concerning OH in the plume. <coughs> so what this says for me is that I don't think the problem came from the, uh, the fact that we don't see the enhancement doesn't come from a, a problem with emissions and oxidants levels. So uh, <coughs> to investigate that further, I looked at another modeling study that was done for that specific case, where um, uh, Manish Rivastava published a paper in Naturecom uh, last year, where he used uh, the WARFCAM uh, 3D uh, regional model with a vo volatility basis set parameterization to predict uh, organic aerosol mass. So to make it quick, the VBS parameterization uh, accounts for the oxidation of isoprene, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes too, I think, and neutropongenic compounds by OH and O3 and ozone to produce four model species defined by their volatility. So the, by their uh, increased volatility here. Um, <coughs> yeah. So additionally, this parameterization accounts for the aging of organic aerosol, which uh, results uh, in general in the increase of the volatility of the organic aerosol. And the yields that are used by the VBS and the aging rates uh, were fitted based on atmospheric chamber experiments in conditions similar to what was seen in Manaus, which means uh, humid aerosol in a low organic aerosol loading and uh, low NOx uh, situations. Oh, no, different NOx situations, sorry. <clears throat> and the result they get from that is this one, where they have here, they, they, they plot the model output following the flight track. Uh, the, blue, uh, the orange line is the organic aerosol mass that was observed by the airplane when it was transecting along the plume. And you can see this orange line has peak, peaks when the airplane is crossing the plume and goes from half a microgram per cubic meter to up to two and a half microgram per cubic meter. Then they run the model with the green line where there is no Manaus emission. And you can see the green line here stays around half a microgram per cubic meter. <clears throat> but when they turn on Manaus emissions, the blue line uh, is the result. And you can see that they managed to get similar peaks to the measurements, which means they are able to reproduce this observed enhancement in the plume, which we were not, not able to do with the explicit chemical mechanism. Uh, additionally, they plot here in pink the contribution of biogenic organic aerosol to total aerosol, uh, organic aerosol mass, and in black, the anthropogenic contribution to organic aerosol. <coughs> and they say that the anthropogenic aerosol is not enough to explain the huge uh, increase in mass. And they make the hypothesis that uh, the biogenic SOA formation itself was enhanced in the plume because of the higher oxidative capacity in the plume. Um, <coughs> So what I wonder is, what would this approach that was used to compare with the flight tracks on the regional model, what would it say if I put it in my box model, give it exactly the same inputs as the, uh, that was used as a, for the explicit model? And uh, 
what would happen? Would, would it be able to reproduce the enhancement that was observed at the T3 site? Uh, when I say semi-inputs, basically I just replaced the part of the model that is condensing aerosol. I just replaced it by the VBS. Everything else is the same. Same oxidants, same precursor, say, same PBL, same, same deposition. Uh, so we can make a fair comparison. And I want to thank uh, Manish Rivasava because he helped me a lot uh, for that implementation. Uh, <clears throat> so here is what we get. Uh, this is the plot I've shown you before. Uh, and here is what we get with the VBS. Uh, the dashed line, the blue is the polluted case. Orange, oh uh, no, blue is clean case. Orange is polluted case. And you can see that even if this parameterization is slightly underestimating the mass concentration at the T3 site, uh, it is able to enhance the mass to reach the polluted uh, concentration, concentration uh, during the afternoon. <clears throat> Something that Gecko is obviously not able to do. And we have to wonder why this happened. Uh, we could look at what is contributing to secondary organic aerosol mass, just in case one of the contributors is way overestimated by Gecko or underestimated by Gecko. So here is, as a function of time, the contribution of monoterpenes, um, isoprene oxidation product that condensed normally in the gas phase, uh, from the gas phase, and IEPOX, uh, isoprene oxidation product that condensed through the IEPOX uh, mechanism, and alkanes in the polluted case. Uh, you can see that we are dominated by monoterpenes uh, all the time, uh, and then for isoprene, half of it is a traditional condensation, and half of it is from IEPOX chemistry. Uh, when you compare to what uh, Manish uh, put in his paper, so for the background case, they have also a domination by monoterpenes, and approximately, uh, well, uh, and then uh, IEPOX and uh, normal isoprene gas phase product contribute to uh, uh, organic aerosol. The blue part is sesquiterpenes that we don't have in Gecko, but their contribution is uh, negligible enough that I don't think it could be the reason at the moment. Uh, and you see that when we switch, they switch from the background to the polluted case, the relative contribution of everything doesn't change a lot. It's just the total mass that increased in their model. I'm just talking about biogenic part of the aerosol. So <clears throat> uh, it seems that we have similar contribution of monoterpenes and isoprene to biogenic SOA, both in uh, VBS and GECOA. Uh, so Maybe that's not where the problem is. Uh, and here we can look at the other part of their uh, parameterization, which is, which is the VBS, the aging of the VBS bins. And to check that, I just turned off the aging part of the parameterization, and we can look at the result here. This is the dotted line here, is the VBS without the aging of the VBS bins. And you can see that it didn't change much for the background case. But when you compare the two <coughs> for the polluted case, the orange dashed line and the orange dots, you can see that the, the VBS loses its ability to enhance the concentration enough to reach the measurements when you turn off aging uh, in the VBS. Uh, which, uh, oh, sorry, which make me, uh, makes us wonder. No, so the idea is so that it means that to reproduce these enhancements, we need some aging in the particle phase. That is not in Gecko at the moment, uh, and uh, I didn't have, the, I didn't implement it in Gecko. But we can still try to look at what kind of processes could be added in Gecko to try to understand uh, why we cannot reach these concentrations in the polluted case. Uh, one place where we can look at is the composition of organic aerosol. Here I plot. Uh, for the T3 site, for clean situation and polluted situations, the AMS measurements of H2C ratio as a function of O2C ratio, what we call a Van Creveren diagram. You, know, you see that <coughs> H2C ratio vary between uh, 1.2 and 1.4, O2C between 0 0.7 and 1. There is no clear di distinction between uh, clean and polluted cases. And where is Gecko on that plot? Well, it's here. So. There is a tiny problem, I think. Uh, <clears throat> so first, the good news is that Gecko has approximately the correct O2C ratio, 
which is a good start. But then we look at the H2C ratio and we are overestimating, way, it's way too high. Uh, one point I, approximately almost two, between 1.9 and two, where, I, where we should be at uh, 1.3. Um, <clears throat> then I'm only speculating here, but what could be the processes that would take these points from here to here? Uh, one idea is that uh, usually come back uh, quite often when you are asking that question is, is something wrong with the fragmentation of orga organic compound in gecko? And this fragmentation could happen in the gas phase. As long as the fragments are heavy enough to condense, then it would have an impact on secondary organic aerosol. It could also be in the aerosol phase. Uh, the VBS parametrization for aging explicitly called that a fragmentation parametrization. So maybe in the aerosol phase, we are missing some processes about the fragmentation of uh, condensed compounds. Uh, it's even very likely. So, but fragmentation would decrease H2C, but the thing is it's, uh, I think, yeah, it, it would also decrease the O2C ratio a little bit. So we have to be careful not to stray too much on the left of the diagram. Uh, another thing that has been uh, speculated on uh, recently is the dimerization of uh, organic compounds. C10 compound could be dimerized to make C20 compound. In the process, their H2C ratio will, um, <clears throat> will decrease, but we still have to do some studies and sensitivity tests to see if it would decrease enough to reach the levels we want. Another place we can look at is the composition of the aerosol from an organic function's point of view. With gecko, we can look at that because we have the identity of every species in the aerosol phase. We can look at the organic functions that are in there and see what, uh, what we can learn from that. Uh, <clears throat> so here, as a function of time, I plotted the number of specific organic functions uh, per carbon atom in the aerosol phase. So that means, for instance, that the total functionalization in the aerosol phase, I, I mean the total number of functions per carbon atom is approximately 0. Point, between 0. 0.5 and 0. 0.6 uh, in the clean case, okay? And you see that the biggest contribution to these uh, functionalities is the hydroxy moieties and the hydroperoxy moieties. Uh, that's something you would expect uh, in a biogenically, uh, biogenic dominated with low NOx uh, uh, situation. Also, an interesting thing is that the functionalization is slightly decreasing in the polluted case because alkane, like the large chain, long chain arc alkane, have condensed into the aerosol as they don't have any uh, function on them, of course, and that would reduce the uh, organic functions per group per carbon atom. But the thing is, any process that would decrease the number of OH functions in favor, for instance, of CO functions would reduce the H2C ratio and keep the O2C ratio where it is. So, and uh, I didn't specifically look at it, but Maybe the fate of peroxy or acoxy radicals could uh, help move this red thing to the purple thing, for instance. Uh, fragmentation also would favor the formation of, carboxy, uh, of uh, uh, carbonyl compounds uh, compared to OH uh, functions. So this is where we're at at the moment with Gecko on this specific case. Um, <coughs> so this uh, opens for future studies, of course. Uh, and my conclusion on that is that with the explicit chemical mechanism in a box model, we are able to reproduce realistic levels of primary organic compound, NOx, OH, and ozone, just based on estimated emissions from Megan and uh, um, the few measurements that are available for Brazilian cities. We are able to reproduce the background levels of organic aerosol, but the problem is that we cannot reproduce the enhancement that was observed in the plume. Uh, so to me, it means that the explicit approach is missing some processes that are implicitly accounted for by the VBS parametrization, because that VBS parametrization was optimized on experimental data. There is a chance that the yields that are using there, used in there are implicitly uh, accounting for these processes that I'm missing. 
Uh, here I'm only guessing, but the missing processes could involve dimerization and fragmentation of organic compounds in the gas phase or the aerosol phase or both. And so I guess the main message is that we still poorly understand what's happening to uh, SOA formation when we are oxidizing biogenics. So this is uh, my conclusion, but uh, before I finish, uh, I want to uh, talk about something else, but that's a subject that I think is uh, interesting to the 3D modelers, for instance, that I don't have a lot of time to explore, so if other people are interested, I'm happy to talk with them. So the idea is that I'm running this gigantic mechanism. To make things simple, we have 400,000 species in the aerosol phase. We cannot put that in a, in a mechanism that is used in a 3D model. So how do we do uh, the reduction of this gigantic mechanism if we wanted to use it in a, in a smaller setting? <coughs> uh, usually, uh, the current ID that's traveling around at the moment is, let's take an existing parameterization and tune it to fit the, uh, exist, the, the explicit model output. What I like to think about sometimes in my free time is how to take the explicit mechanism, what should we remove from it to get a small mechanism, but keep the same informational content uh, in our small mechanism. Uh, so to look at that and try to understand what we could do, I didn't do anything, but I tried to think about what we could do. <clears throat> I plot here, as a function of time, the number of species that would be needed to represent 90% of the total mass in the aerosol. It means that I take my output, and I just keep the uh, uh, largest contribution in the aerosol until I reach 90% of the mass. And you can see that be uh, between the background and the polluted case is quite different. We go from a few 400 species in a clip case. That means I need 400 species to account for 90% of the mass. To almost 3,000 species in a polluted case because we have 55 more precursors in there. The, the, the diversity of species in the aerosol is so high that we need more species to account for 90% of the mass. So that's inter interesting, but I think 3,000 species is still too much for 3D models, but we could make an effort. Uh, another way to, oh yeah, another way to look at it is to use what some, uh, some of our colleagues have been using to look at uh, organic aerosol composition, individual organic aerosol particle composition. I'm using, in that case, something called the diversity, which is just the exponential of the Shannon entropy, or the first order generalized entropy, if you prefer, uh, which is uh, basically, in that case, I use the mass fraction of every species, so pi, multiplied by log of pi, I take the minus sign, of course, and we get an entropy similar to the Shannon entropy. If you exponentiate that, you get a number that I like to call the effective number of species, and I will come back to this. And this number is between approximately 100 to 400 species uh, in the aerosol phase. So that's where uh, I'm mostly guessing, or maybe starting to think about it only, is that the diversity in that case could be interpreted as a lower limit for the size of the chemical mechanism. That is, a reduced mechanism would need at least d species at a given time to represent the same informational content in the Shannon sense as the fully explicit mechanism if we only want to predict SOA mass. Uh, the only problem is I don't know what are these 400 species. Uh, I have, don't think the 400 species at 6 p.m. are the same 400 species at 2 p.m. Um, and I have no idea if this is individual species or nonlinear combination of existing species, for instance. So it's quite complicated. But maybe it, it tells us something about how far we could go in reducing the chemical mechanisms. And we could also use a similar approach to in investigate what would that limit be if you want to keep information that is not about the mass, but could be about organic functional groups, for instance, which would help us predict optical properties or toxicity, so with some effects on uh, um, climate change or health impacts. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you.
Questions? What topics will, be, will you be looking at in France, and do you expect that it will relate to what you've just shown us? Uh, yes, in France, I would be looking at urban chemistry and specifically about optimizing parameterization based on gecko outputs. So uh, I don't know if any of this can be used for that, because I think for safety, we would use more traditional techniques. But uh, yes, it will be related to these kind of things. Um, I thought it was really interesting um, how I was wondering, it seems like experimentally that oligomerization processes forming SOA is really important from mm -hmm. the experimental community, but it's not in Gecko A yet. And how much do you think, are you, is there a future direction to add that into Gecko A and how much could that be impacting your results? You mentioned it a little bit, but if you could explain. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's how I basically implement this process in Gecko. How much? So, uh, how much work uh, would that need, or if somebody is trying to do that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, a long time ago, I know that someone in France tw tried to implement some dimerization, very crude thing. You, know, you take a molecule and you just put two molecules together, and you get twice the molecular weight, basically. It comes with a lot of problems, because Gecko tends to want to oxidize anything you give it. So if you start with a C10, you dimerize it, you get a C20. And if you need to write the chemical mechanism for that C20 compound, then you, are, you have a chemical, comp uh, a chemical mechanism which size is exponentially growing. So that's kind of worse than what we're already doing. Uh, but at some point, you reach limits where it's not needed to write the chemical mechanism. So uh, it's possible to do it. Some people have tried, but the problem is uh, we don't have enough, because for Gecko, we need rules like to decide what's happening to a compound that nobody else has ever seen. So if we don't have enough experimental data, we cannot derive the general rule to use in, a, in, the, in the protocol. So that's the main limit, limitation at the moment, because otherwise it's not too complicated to do, and some sensitivity tests have been done a long time ago. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I have a small comment. Um, maybe principal component analysis could be uh, helpful to reduce the dimension of the data will um, we'll, um, uh, uh, keeping a desired number of variability. Yeah, that's um, uh, maybe not just PCA, but other things like unsupervised re uh, dimensionality reductions and things like that. But um, some people in ACOM, uh, Alma, but C1 too, uh, he's not here, are collaborating with uh, machine learning people at CISL to try to see what can be done to, uh, to, find, to reduce the chemical mechanism using statistical method and things like that, yeah. Any other questions? No. So I'm just curious, so you spend a lot of time looking at, at Go Amazon data, and, um, and still we don't have the answer of the interactions between biogenics and ontropogenics. We don't really know, I mean, is VBS is good or Gecko. So do you think we need a new campaign, and uh, in which conditions? <laughs> well, if I'm not the one paying for it, I'm always happy for a new field campaign. <laughs> um, I think Go Amazon was a great set, uh, like a great, great place to study this. Uh, the only problem is they didn't have all the instruments that would have been needed to uh, constrain the models more, for instance. But with all the new uh, sims uh, toys they have now, maybe it would be interesting to, uh, to come back there and look into the details of aerosol, organic aerosol composition, for instance, that we don't really have here apart from some AMS analysis. Any other questions? No? Okay. Let's thank Camille and wish him luck at Toulouse. <laughs>